In this section, we're going to talk mostly about initial value problems and a little bit about the existence theorem. Now, quick comment. If you were told that y double prime is equal to x, well, if you were to integrate both sides with respect to x, then you will get y prime is x squared over 2 plus a constant. We'll call a constant c1. Now, if I were to integrate a second time with respect to x, the left side, the integral of y prime is just y. The integral of x squared over 2 is x cubed over 2 times 3. Plus, the integral of a constant dx is a constant times x. So every time you integrate, you get a constant. So all I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make here is that differential equations lots of times will have a constant. Now if you are given some initial conditions, like y of 0 is 1, I, mean, I don't know y is 0 or y prime is 0 is 2. It doesn't always have to be at 0. You can then find those constants. And that's what we're going to talk about now. And another comment is if there are two constants, you better be given two pieces of information. Now, Suppose you were told that y is equal to 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x is a solution to y prime equals y minus y squared. And the initial condition is y of negative 1 equals 2. y of negative 1 equals 2. So right now, we know that this is the solution to this equation for any constant. Actually, I should say y equals 1 over 1 plus c e to the negative x is a family of solution. Why? Because there's one solution for each c you put in. No matter what c is, y prime will be y minus y squared. For this problem, let's actually work that out. Since I have to find y prime, I'm going to rewrite y like this. 1 plus c e to the negative x all to the negative one. So then y prime is, well, we have a function of x to a power. Keep the function the same, bring down the power, make the new power one less, then multiply by the derivative of what's in here, which is negative c, e to the negative x. This negative and that negative will cancel out. Multiplying by 1 don't bother. So you get c e to the negative x times this to the negative 2. Since the power is negative, I'll put it in the denominator and I'll make it square. So that's y prime. I now have the left side. I just need to show that y minus y squared is exactly the same. Okay. y minus y squared. Well, y is given at the top left minus 1 squared, which is 1 over c e to the negative x squared. Well, what's attracting? And we should have a common denominator. And the common denominator is that. So in this fraction, in the first fraction, the top and bottom, I'm going to multiply by 1 plus c e to the negative x. 
one plus k root of the negative x. And the bottom, this times that, is exactly this. And the top, 1 times root of the negative x is easy, minus 1. So the 1's cancel out, and all I get is that. It's just exactly what I was supposed to get. That is why prime really does equal this. And it doesn't matter what the constant is. The problem is, is that when you have a, you, an initial value condition, you, you can usually find out what the value of C is. Now, I know that when I plug in negative 1 in here, 1 over 1 plus E to the negative negative 1, which is just E to the 1, I'll write it down without the exponent. This is supposed to equal 2. And I'm big on reciprocals. I want to solve for C. If I take the reciprocal of the left side, I get 1 plus C E. If I take the reciprocal of the right side, which is understood to be 2 over 1, I get a half. I want, it's this plus that equals 2 and a half. If I want to, I want sorry, first alter the term that has the unknown C. That is, I take away one from both sides. And then I get that C E is negative a half. And then it's friendly to divide by E on the left side. Because then I just get C. But I'll be honest, dividing negative a half by C, it looks like a pain. So I can multiply by the reciprocal. Negative 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. 2 times e is 2e. I solve for the constant. So the solution is really 1 over 1 plus a negative 1 over 2e. e to the negative x. I would multiply each term on the top on each term in the bottom by 2e. So I get 2e on the top. So I multiply that by 2e. I multiply that by 2e. I get 2e minus. I multiply that by 2e. I just get e to the negative x. That's one answer. You can leave, you can even divide each of these by e. So you get 2e over e is 2. This 2e over e is 2. And that divided by e is e. Like I said, it's 2. And then when you divide this by e, you subtract the exponent. That is, e to the negative x over an understood e to the 1, and you subtract the exponent, the top minus the bottom. Personally, I'm a bigger fan of this answer, but either way, those are two ways to say what y equals. So we found the exact solution, the cold air particular solution. Okay, so let us consider another problem like this. Suppose that you come to learn that x equals c1 times cosine t plus c2 times sine t is a family of solutions to this equation. X prime, X double prime plus X equals zero. X double prime plus X equals zero. 
and the initial condition are x of pi over 2 is 0 and x prime of pi over 2 which is 1. Okay. We want to find a solution to this equation and you give it using or incorporating the initial value condition. Now, just for the record, it makes this equation mean this. It makes sense that it's going to be a sine and a cosine. I mean, after all, if you have cosine of x, the first derivative is negative sine x, and the next derivative is cosine. In fact, if I call this x, then this here is x double prime, and uh, when I bring this over, it should become like this. And of course, when you add those two, you're going to get zero which is exactly what we're supposed to get. But up to now, we haven't learned how to solve any differential equation. We're given the answer. We're told that a family solution to this equation is that equation. But now we want to find C1 and C2. And look, they gave us two pieces of information. We know that x of pi over 2, so I use the x formula, is equal to c1 times the cosine pi over 2 plus c2 times the sine of pi over 2. Okay. I know this is the cosine graph, and I don't walk around knowing the cosine of pi over 2. I probably should, but I don't. But I see this graph. This is 0. That's 2 pi. I know pi is in the middle. Oh, between 0 and pi, that's what I'm looking for, pi over 2. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. The sine of pi over 2, well, you should know that's pi. You have to go 0 to 2 pi, and then say this is pi fine. And then pi over 2 is here. And the height is 1. The sine of pi over 2 is 1. So I get C1 times 0, which is 0, plus C2 times 1, which is C2. That is, I get C2. On one hand, x of pi over 2 is C2. On the other hand, they told me it was 0. So now I know C2 is 0. So this term just gets knocked out. So now I know that x is c1 cosine 2. Well, if x is c1 times cosine of 2, taking the derivatives, x prime is negative c1 times the sine of 2. I took the derivative, so now I can plug in pi over 2. x prime pi over 2 is negative c1 times the sine of pi over 2. The sine of pi over 2 is 1. Negative c1 times 1 is negative c1. That's what x prime of pi over 2 equals on one hand. On the other hand, they told me it equals 1. So that implies that c1 is negative. If you change that sign, I get C1, and you let it change that sign, you get negative x. If you come to know the negative x is 4, and it's baffling how, in my opinion, teachers teach this so poorly. You change this sign, this understood plus sign, it becomes a minus. <laughs> change both signs. If you had that negative x is negative 7. Change both signs. Don't let it be hard. x is 7. You have negative x is 4. Understood plus 4. You change this sign. Positive x. You change that to negative 4. 
So positive x is negative 4. We just change cosine. This is justification of that. You can multiply both sides by negative 1. And multiplying by negative 1 just changes the sign. Okay. In any case, we now have what C1 equals and what C2 equals. So copying down the very top equation, I know that f of t is C1 times cosine t plus 0 times sine t. Well, that's 0. The rule for adding 0 is don't bother. And this is exactly the answer that I said you would get. Now, this path equation is a, one can say it is a uh, two parameter. Two parameter family of solutions. Why two parameter and not three or not one? The answer is there were two unknowns. Two unknowns, two parameter family of solutions. One unknown, one parameter family of solutions. And so on. If you are given that y1 equals c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the negative x, is a two parameter family of solutions to say y double prime minus y equals zero where y of one is zero y prime of 1 is 1. So if I give you the initial values, I tell you some concrete points on this curve y. I tell you some concrete points on the curve y. And I tell you it crosses the point, well that's x, and that's y. It crosses the point 1, 0, and that's x, and that's y. It crosses the point 1, 8. You can find c1 and c2. So, let us find, well, I should say that the derivative contains that point. And the y contains this point, and y prime contains that point. So, y of 1 is copying this, except I put 1 for x, is c1 e to the 1, plus c2 e to the negative 1. And that first one I don't need, because e to the 1 is e. Well, I am told that this equals 0. I am told that this is zero. Okay, now y prime, okay, hold on to that. Y prime taking the derivative of y is c1 e to the x minus c2 e to the negative x. The derivative of negative x is negative 1. So y prime of 1 is c1 e to the 1 minus c2 e to the negative 1. And this time it equals e. Now, with these two equations, I can solve the c1 and c2. Let me put them here. This is the top one, and this is the bottom one. And I notice if I add these, 
those cancel out. So I get 2C1E equal to E. Well, this number times E is E. That number must be 1. I don't care what we call a number. You multiply E by some number and you get back E. You multiply by 1. 2 times a half is 1. C1 is a half. C1 is a half. So I'm going to put that right here. C1 is a half. Now, you can come back, and I'm, and I'm going to erase this. You can come back to this equation, and this time, instead of adding, you subtract. Now, this cancels out. Remember, we are subtracting positive C2e to the negative 1 minus a negative C2e to the negative 1. C2e to the negative 1 minus a negative C2e to the negative 1. I can change those two signs and I will get 2C2e to the negative 1. And 0 minus e is e. If I divide by 2 e to the negative 1 on both sides, I get that C2 is e to the 2 over 2. Get that C2 is e to the 2 over 2. There's an understood 1 here. I'm going to do 1 minus a negative 1. You get a 2. Please don't say you get zero. Because if you get zero, it's because you know very well that one minus one is zero. The only problem is, is that's not a one. That number is not a one. It is a negative one. So it's not zero. If you have one, you can only take away one number and get zero. And that number you have to take away is one. And if you take away, say, a negative one, and then you won't get zero. So now we claim that we now have the final function. Copying down this very top function with this new information, we have that y is c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the negative x. And that's supposed to be a solution to this equation. Okay. We can verify that. Y prime will be 1 half times the derivative e to the x, which is e to the x, plus the constant, e squared over 2, times the derivative of that. The derivative of e to the negative x is e to the negative x times the, the derivative of the power which is negative 1. So that addition will become subtraction. And the second derivative can be 1 half e to the x plus e squared over 2 e to the negative x. Now, when, when you subtract two quantities and you get 0, it's because those two quantities are equal. Well, look y double prime, that's y double prime, and y is this, and look it, they're both the same. It's above this line, and it's above this line, they're exactly the same. So yes, so what I did, when I'm erasing, I didn't have to do, that's called the check. But here is a particular solution. It is the solution to the initial value problem. If y prime, if the differential equation is this, and you have these initial conditions, then there's the value. There's the solution. That's the solution. Next, 
set of columns, we're going to use the existing stamp. We're not going to get big tons into this. Suppose you were asked to determine a region of the XY plane for which this for this differential equation, say this one, would have a an N unique solution to graph passes through a point x sub zero y sub zero in the region. So we're going to do a number of these problems, and all I'm going to do is change different equations. What you need to do first is you need to solve for dy dx. And the first problem I gave you is already solved for. And what dy dx equals is f of x. That's important. Now we take the partial of f. Now, f is this with respect to y. Now, remember the derivative of the square root of y is 1 over 2 square root of x. And the square root of xy is the square root of x times the square root of y. So, with respect to y, this is just a constant. The derivative of the square root of x times the square root of y, this is a constant, times the derivative of the square root of y, which we did. It's 1 over 2 square root of y. With these, these two have to be continuous to have a, the solution in, that you're looking for. Yeah. When I look in the bottom, the first thing I see is y cannot equal 0. y cannot equal 0. And here I see that x times y has to be at least 0. And over here, in fact, I'm going to change what I said initially. When I look here, I see that y has to be greater than 0. It can't be negative. It can't take the square root of negative. And over here, when I look there, I see that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. The bottom can't equal 0. y can't equal 0. Well, I claim something's redundant. We have three conditions. And I claim this middle one is redundant. After all, if x is positive and y is positive, then yes, x times y will be positive. And if x is 0 and y is positive, then yes, x times y will equal 0. So that's redundant. All we have is that x and y both have to be positive. Well, where is that? X is positive to the right of the y-axis and y is positive only when you're above the x-axis. Only when you're above the x-axis is y positive. Well, where is x and y both positive? Look for overlapping. It's in quadrant one. Quadrant one. That is, if you take if it passes through a point in quadrant one, there is a solution. What I meant to say is if this 
point x0, y0 is in quadrant 1. That is x0 some positive number and y0 is some positive number. In fact, x0 can be 0. There will be a unique solution. Now, there is just a little bit something wrong here. I said that x can be positive. Maybe I should have used a different color. Not only can x be positive, not only could x be positive, but x can equal 0. And everywhere there are points on that line where the y's are positive. It's quadrant 1 and the upper half of the y-axis. Now, can it be 0? Can it can it contain the origin 0, 0? Can it contain this point here? The answer is no, because at that point right there, x is 0, which is okay. But y is 0. And we've been saying that y had to be positive. So any point in quadrant 1 and the upper half of the y-axis, you're okay. That would be a solution. You would have a unique solution if you pass any point in quadrant 1, including the y-axis. As I promised, we'll do a few of these, and all that's going to change is the function. Suppose you are now given that dy dx minus x minus y is 0. So the first step you do, and this is how you study any math class. You don't do millions of problems, but in addition to doing millions of problems, you memorize the steps. You should understand the steps, to know the steps that you're going to do. Step 1, solve the differential equation for dy dx by bringing the x and y over. So I get x plus y. Well, this is f of x, y. And that's continuous everywhere. If I take the partial of f, and this is f, what's it says? Little f equals this. Take the partial of f with respect to y, I just get 1. This is continuous everywhere. They're both. They're continuous everywhere. So any point you give me will be solution. Any x0, y0 will have a unique solution. Okay, let's try another one. Is that asking you for the region? Describe the region of solutions. Suppose you are now given that 1 plus y cubed times y prime. This is equal to x squared. So 1 plus y cubed times y prime, which is the y dx, is equal to x squared. Well, if you just divide both sides by 1 plus y cubed, on the left side, the, y, the 1 plus y cubed disappears, and you just have dy dx. On the left side, it doesn't disappear. Now, this is f of xy. Now, since I want to take the derivative with respect to y, I'm going to bring the only term that has y, the only factor that has y, to the top. It's the power negative one. So now, 
I can take the partial of f with respect to y. This is a constant of 5. Multiply it by the negative 1. That is 3 on the power. Make the new power 1 less. Multiply by the derivative of what thing there. Just 3 y squared. It's this times this is a negative 2 times that. Since this factor has a negative exponent, I cross the division. It's in the top, I put in the bottom. And what survives on top is negative, negative 3, x squared, y squared. And that is the partial of f with respect to y. So, so let's box this one in here. The question is, when are both of these continuous? Well, this top one, it has a problem when the bottom is zero. Bring, so it can't be zero. Bring the one over, the y cubed is negative one. Can't be negative one. What do you cube to get negative 1? Negative 1. So y cannot be negative 1. Okay. Now, when it comes to the partial derivative, the numerator is fine. You just have a problem with the bottom. Well, the thing is, is 1 plus y cubed squared equals 0. It, it doesn't equal 0 is exactly when the base is not zero. That is, we still arrive at the same answer. So as long as we stay away from negative one, we are okay. So which regions work? Y is bigger than negative one, or Y is below negative one. There's a problem at negative one. Stay away from this. Stay away from that line. Take a point that isn't on that line, you're okay. So this here is the answer. This is the region where you would have a unique solution. Guaranteed, no question about it. Let's try another one, please. How about you're given that y prime is y plus x over 1 minus x. Now, I try not to give shortcuts or what I think are shortcuts very often, and, and, unless they're real simple. But in this case, I'm going to use a little shortcut. y prime is dy dx. Now, if you are going to take the derivative, because I want to call this dx, dx, partial f. Well, I want this, this here is f of x, y. Sorry. I want to calculate the partial of x with respect to y. Well, y is in the numerator and denominator. That means I have to use the quotient rule. So we can get around that. I notice the top and the bottom are similar. I have y minus x in the bottom. If I only had y minus x in the top, I know what that is. It's 1. A y minus x plus 2x, that's y plus x. Well, this is the same as y minus x over y minus x plus 2x over y minus x. That is dy dx is 1 plus 2x over y minus x. That is, it's 1 plus 2x, the anticipation of taking derivative of that. And you may say, well, that's not a shortcut. Well, if you see it quickly, 
you, you can get right to this. You can get right to this. Now, this is f of xy. So the partial of f with respect to y, and the derivative of 1 is 0, plus the derivative function. So that's a constant. Bring down the power, keep, keep y minus x the same. Bring down the power, becomes negative 2x, make the new power 1 less, then multiply by the derivative of what's in there. No quotient there. I get negative 2x over y minus x squared. Now, when I look at dy dx, and I look at the partial of x with respect to y, they both only have problems in the denominator. This can't be 0, and this squared can't be 0. Now that means this can't be 0. There's only one quantity you can square and get 0. If I ask you what squared equals 0, you should tell me 0. So when I ask you x squared equals 0, you should tell me x should be 0. If I tell you x minus 2 squared is 0, you should tell me x minus 2 must be 0, or x is 2. So we have that y minus x can't be 0. That is, y can't be x. So the solution is y can be bigger than x, or y can be less than x. This x0, y0 can be any two, can be any point. That is, x and y, or x0 and y0 can be any numbers you like, except they can't be the same. x and y have to be different. x and y have to be different. So 2, 3, if I said 2, 3, you should say, yep, there can be a unique solution. If I tell you 5, 5, you should say no. There is not a unique solution. Let's try another one. That's how you learn to keep doing problems. So suppose well, let's just word this one differently. Does the existence theorem guarantee that the differential equation y prime equals the square root of y square minus 9 possesses and Unique solution through the given point. Okay. And the points are going to be, say, 2, 5, 3, 5, 2, negative 3, and 5, negative 3. And you need to say yes or no for each of them. The solution starts underneath here. dy dx equals this. So f of xy is y squared minus 9 square root. And remember, the derivative of u is in the bottom 2 times the square root of u and on top u prime. So the partial of f with respect to that letter. You pick. So this whole mess is u. So in the bottom you have 2 square root of u. So that's how I write u. And on top I have the derivative of u, which is 2y. The y's are going to cancel. Now, in the top here, I have what's under the radical. It can equal 0, or it can be bigger than 0. In the bottom here, 
I have what in the bottom cannot be zero, but it has to be positive. But what's under the radical has to be positive. When you combine these together, you get that y squared minus 9 has to be zero. If I'm thinking of a number, right, it doesn't matter that I'm calling it y squared minus 9. I tell you today that the number is greater than or equal to zero. And tomorrow, I tell you the number is bigger than zero. And I ask you, what can y squared minus 9 be? Well, you could, you know, you, today, you can say it can be zero, or it can be 11. But tomorrow, I'm telling you it's bigger than zero. So you should conclude with these two pieces of information that you should only give me positive numbers. All right. So when is y squared minus 9 positive? Adding 9 to both sides is when y squared is positive. That means y can be bigger than 3, because if you take numbers bigger than 3 and you square them, you get more than 9. And, or, or I guess, or y can be less than negative 3. Because if you take numbers to the left of negative 3, like negative 4 and negative 5, etc., when you square it, it doesn't care about the negativeness. When you square 4 or negative 4, get the same answer. If you square negative 2.8 or negative 3.8, and positive 3.8, you get the same answer. You square pi and negative pi, you get the same answer. I'm just doing the mirror image. If when I square these numbers, I get above 9, but then when I square those numbers, I also get above 9. So, basically, what, so that's the region. But maybe I didn't even need that. What I need to say is y can't be plus or minus 3. y is 3? No. y is negative 3? No. y is not 3 or negative 3? Yes. Not 3 or negative 3? Yes. What does yes mean? It means that this point will be a unique solution. That is, if I tell you that y prime is equal to the square root of y squared minus 9. And the initial condition is y of 2 is equal to 5. You will find an answer. Remember, that's x and that's y. You take y of x's and you get back y values. This point, if that was initial condition, you'd have a solution. But not this one. If I told you y of negative 2 is negative 3. You should say, nope, not a solution. It doesn't work. Or, or y of 5 is positive 3. No. In fact, I don't care what number I put in there. That is, if you couldn't make out the number, you couldn't make out that 39, then you should say, you can still say, no, it's not a solution. Don't run up to your teacher and say, what's that x value? doesn't matter what x is. And that is that y is not 3 or negative 3. And it is 3. So you say no. If it was 31 and you couldn't make out that number, you would say yes, it's a solution. doesn't matter what the number is. That completes this section on initial value conditions.